Welcome to the Evolution of Aloha podcast with me, Dr. Jerry Ibalarosa Tanel. Now let's talk story. Welcome everyone to the Evolution of Aloha podcast with Plowline Production, and I am your host, Dr. Jerry Ibalarosa Tanel. And today we'll be talking with Sherry Mitchell. She was born and raised on the Penobscot Indian Reservation, and she speaks and teaches around the world on issues of indigenous rights, environmental justice and spiritual change. Her broad-based knowledge allows her to synthesize many subjects into a cohesive whole, weaving together a multitude of complex issues and articulating them in a way that both satisfies the mind and heals the heart. But before we get started, one of the first things that I'd like to do is honor the land in which our feet stand. And I will begin by acknowledging that those of us who are gathering in the Pacific Northwest area, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people who have lived in a Salish Sea Basin since time immemorial. We respect this place and honor the sacred spiritual connection to the land, water, and its people, past, present, and future. And by acknowledging these lands and their original indigenous inhabitants, we reach back to our own indigenous roots and reflect on the impacts of colonialism and the lands from which all our people come. We're connected to our ancestors through this connection to land for the land is what connects us all. So please join me in taking a moment to honor the land of the traditional people and the territory in which you stand. Today, I honor the Tulalip tribes and allied bands for their enduring care and continuous protection of the land where I currently reside. So thank you so much, Sherry, for being here with me today. It's my pleasure. And I just would like to thank you for inviting me and to acknowledge the ancestors of of your land and would also like to take a moment to just acknowledge my own ancestors and where I come from by introducing myself in my language, which puts me in context, not only with my people, but with the place where I'm residing. So I'll just say, um, Um, my name and my language is Wanahamu Gwasit, and my family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Tibayak. So I, am, I come from those lands uh, where my feet currently stand uh, in a place called Wajukum Deltina Kinship Community, um, which is the campus for our, my organization. And uh, Wajukum Deltina means let's help one another. So this is where we're standing together. Oh, that is so, that is so beautiful. You know, it's like, um, you have been such a um, integral part of my dissertation. And as I was uh, going through the uh, process of, um, so, so my dissertation is on the evolution of Aloha systemic change through personal transformation. And in, in the process of writing my dissertation, I wanted to acknowledge my ancestors by rediscovering what it meant to be indigenous. And reading reading your book, Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change, you spoke at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And um, it was recommended, they're like, okay, if you're talking about this sacredness, you need to go and listen to Sherry Mitchell. And it was like my first, it was probably my first year in my PhD program. And I I bought your book and I was like, I keep going back. And every time I go back to it, I learn something new. (laughs) And it's so beautiful because you come, you, you talk about this place of healing. And right now in our country, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's such a big push, a lot of big initiatives happening but we never talk about how did we get here in the first place? How did we get here in the first place? And so, you know, in my work, I've been doing, I've been doing work around, around DEI, but I've also brought in colonization. And I did that because I started to rediscover what it meant to be indigenous. 
I went back to the islands of Hawaii and I spent a lot of time researching on where my people came from. And there were some things that I uncovered where I'm like, ooh, that hurts. So my whole entire life, born and raised in Hawaii, I'm mixed race. And so being Hawaiian, Chinese, Filipino, Spanish, and Portuguese, but showing up and presenting as this brown indigenous woman, I would always look through the lens of being in Hawaii. And in, in Hawaii, everyone was family. And when I moved to the mainland, it wasn't like that anymore. I was put and placed into this box where I found myself assimilating into the white dominant culture. And I forgot who I was and I um, didn't know what it meant to be indigenous or Hawaiian or walking around in this mixed race body. And when I came across your work, I realized that what I needed to do was to heal myself in order to even talk about working towards healing the world. So when you wrote your book, um, what inspired you to write Sacred Instructions? Having always been somebody who writes as a form of of personal therapy and, uh, you know, to move energy through my body and get things out of my head and out of my body and onto the paper. Um, it seemed to come somewhat naturally, but in regard to this, uh, we have been taught that when you take these things that are timeless, that have a living essence to them and you put them on paper, it limits them to a snapshot in time. It takes away the living quality of what's being shared and it leaves our, our teachings up for interpretation by those who are intent on misunderstanding. Um, and that, you know, our words can often be used against us as indigenous peoples. Um, and so uh, I had been working with the American uh, Indian elders and medicine people's councils of North and South America for about 20 years. 25 years at that point. And uh, as a young person, first of all, just helping them to do whatever it is they needed to do, um, helping them to make sure that they their work was supported in whatever ways it needed to be supported. These are very humble people, you know, who keep their heads down to keep their heart close to the earth. And um, they normally just are in their communities and they're the ones that keep the ceremonies. They're the ones that keep the knowledge for the people. Uh, but there was a lot of harm being done to sacred sites. And so these elders came together to address that. And, um, and I, as a young person, was, had the incredible gift of being able to work with them and to serve them um, and to take care of them uh, and make sure that they were getting what they needed in a good way. Uh, over the years, and then ended up doing a lot of ghostwriting for them for statements that they that they submitted to the UN and to other international bodies related to Indigenous rights, but also to the United States government, um, in order to have the spiritual elders recognized uh, in the consultation agreements, because as keepers of the ceremonies, they're not always elected officials, so their voices aren't heard. Throughout that entire process, there were some of these most traditional elders who would never even sign their name to a document uh, because they just were so against the writing down of things, um, the capturing of something on paper and holding it there and taking away the living essence of it. And so it was a journey for me to get to this place. And one of the elders who never once in, in all of those years ever once signed his name uh, invited me to his house for ceremony. And he's the one that told me that I needed to do this. And I questioned him and I said, you're the one that's, that's always said that we never, you know, sign these documents. We say what we need to say, but we never put it in writing. You've never signed any of these documents. Uh, and he said, yeah, but now you're living in a different time. And these things need to be known. And so he was the one that really told me that I was required to do this. Um, um, as part of my own spiritual journey. And I still had some trepidation. It took a long time. Uh, and, but the year before um, I wrote Sacred Instructions, he passed away. 
And um, I was devastated by the loss of this beautiful elder who was just so gentle and kind. Um, and so that really was my point of, of movement with it was to just, okay, in honor of the life that this beautiful human being led and the gentle, kind, loving way that they went about carrying themselves uh, and walking so gently upon the earth, I'm going to honor them by, by meeting this last request that they had of me. Uh, and so that's kind of the origination point for sacred instructions was that elder who I had known for so long and worked with for so long and um, who charged me essentially with doing this and some other things that will be forthcoming. That's, um, <clears throat> we would uh, call that uh, in Hawaii, our, um, our kuleana. That's mm -hmm. our responsibility to, you know, share that knowledge, especially if it's a request from, from the elders. And, you know, in, in your book, you, um, you know, there's, 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 there's all the struggles that is, that's happening. And I could find myself, you know, you're talking about this, uh, this uh, energy. And in Hawaii, we call this energy mana that exists between people that, exp that exists within all living things. And even though that there's, you know, we're in this place of, of chaos right now and um, being far away from home and seeing the desecration of sacred lands, what's happening over in Mauna Kea. Um, you know, it's like right now the, the military on Oahu is poisoning the aquifers in, you know, the, the waters where my, where my family lives. And there's all of these things where we can find ourselves, well, at least I can find myself being so angry, being so angry and being, you know, just wanting to um, not, have conversations with people who are the ones that's doing this. Right. How do you how do you get people to come together in this place where we can? We've got to do it together, Sherry. We can't do it. There, there's no other way. Right. Yeah, this is a very common question. Um, people struggle with this, and I did write about this a little bit in my book about um, having these experiences of of seeing myself in relation to the rest of life and um, being able to have an experience where I realize that this, uh, what we call in um, that that deep connection between all of the beings was not theoretical, that it was actually something very tangible and um, having an experience with that in a, in a really deep spiritual way helped to shift my mindset around it because I had a moment of recognition where I understood that I really was everyone else, that I was, I was more than just uh, connected to them because we're sharing the, the sources of our survival in this one little tiny space here on earth, um, but connected to them in deep ways through quantum entanglement. You know, all of our web of life teachings are really a deep understanding of quantum entanglement that we all come from the same body of matter. And therefore we are never separated energetically or spiritually. And having that, that recognition that we are all born out of one seed of life, which makes us one living being having simultaneous individualized experiences of ourselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, just, just having that recognition helped me to see those who I, I perceived as being lost on the path as my relatives. Uh, and those who were creating some pretty serious harm being my relatives who were suffering from a spiritual or mental illness. And um, thinking about if that were me, how would I want to be met on the path? Um, if I was mentally ill and I was lost and I was struggling and I was behaving badly, would I want somebody to meet me with violence or would I want somebody to meet me lovingly and guide me back home? Uh, and so that, that really helps me to to think about how am I going to show up and meet myself on the path if I know that I am truly, you know, one with everyone else and recognizing that that oneness does not equate to sameness. Right. Uh, I'm, if I'm recognizing that about myself, then really I'm deciding how I'm going to behave in relation to my own being. And so that 
that depth of awareness for me was really profound and life changing in a lot of ways. Um, but I also think we could just, you know, only go as far back as the civil rights movement and look at um, some of the writings of Derek Bell, who is this preeminent civil rights scholar who talked about interest convergence points. Uh, you know, what are the interest convergence points between us and those that we feel so fundamentally different from? Uh, the divide in, in the United States and Canada and in other parts of the Americas and really all over the world is growing day by day because of the, <clears throat> you know, the propaganda of difference being dangerous um, and, um, and the belief that if there's any difference, then there's no place we can, we can meet. Um, you know, and I'd like to come back to that after because I think that that's what makes some of this um, gender non-conforming um, language and experiences that we're having right now, some of the most important experiences that we're having on the planet because it's breaking down this binary thinking that we have of this or that, black or white, all or nothing, friend or foe. Um, and, and we need to have that thinking, that, that mindset broken down and, and dissolve so that we can expand our minds, right? To see that there are places where we can find points of interest. Um, you know, maybe we disagree on everything, but maybe we all love our kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe we disagree on everything, but we all uh, really at the end of the day wanna be able to survive on the earth. Um, and so where are those interest convergence points? We can only find them if we actually enter into relationship with that other person, um, that other group. If we get to know them on a deep level, to know what is important to them, what lights their fire, what are they, what are they willing to stand up for to protect? Um, and so when we can enter into relationship with others in that way who are so, you know, what seems like so dynamically opposed to our position, we're gonna find a point of interest that we can begin working with that um, and, you know, and, and start working away from the fire. So if the, you know, this is the hotbed issue over here, start working on, you know, both of our kids uh, like soccer. Uh, let's talk about this and build relationship over here about what, what do we love about our kids? What do we, what do we, how do we want to support them? You know, uh, or maybe we all like to plant certain plants, right? Maybe we have the same things in our garden at home. Um, you know, maybe we're reading similar books or, um, you know, watching the same shows on television. So what is that interest convergence point that, that starts us building relationship away from the fire? And then we can slowly walk towards that once we've actually opened our eyes to see the humanity in one another. Um, and all of this divisiveness serves to shadow and blind us to the humanity of others where we just see them in relation to a cause or an issue. Uh, and then automatically label them as enemy. And we don't take the time to get to know who they are as a human being and what makes their heart tick, right? What is it that uh, excites them? What is it that, um, you know, softens their heart? What is it that, um, you know, lights a, a, a fire in their belly to get them to move? What, what incites them to action? You know, those kinds of things can only be learned in relationship with others. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that is so powerful. You know, it's like um, we have this illusion of separation that we believe that we that we are separate from each other. We have this, I don't know, it's like this innate need to categorize us, put us, put ourselves in boxes based off of race and gender and religion and place. And, you know, um, Everything that you, everything that you're talking about on this, this connection, this connection that is beyond what we see, this energy that, um, you know, pretty much connects us beyond the realms. A lot of times, people would be like, "Oh, that's so woo woo, that's such woo woo stuff," and I'm like, "Okay, well, let me let me tell you this: if being woo woo means that I am going to care for you." and care for, care for the land that you're on, the food that you eat, the children that you love, if I'm going to care for you that way, then let's decolonize what woo-woo means, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we look at woo-woo as something that is like way out there, and it's something that is 
is not tangible. But if we are able to connect with each other, I always tell people, I'm like, you ever walk into a room and you can feel the energy in the room? And they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, you ever think of someone that you probably haven't seen in a while and they either drop you a, an email or you see them in the grocery store and they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, what is that? Why don't we talk about that? Let's talk about that connection. And when we're able to talk about that connection, we can see each other, not for who we are, for these human beings, not these racialized labels that, that we place on one another, which in, in the work that I do, whenever I talk about racialized labels and that we should, we should see each other for our humanity and not for, the peop- not for the color of our skin or where we come from, there's a lot of pushback. Like, Jerry, you need to go ahead and you need to you need to attack that. I'm like, but if I attack and I cause harm, when is a healing going to happen? When is a healing going to happen? The work the work that I do is based of the foundation of Aloha. And of course, a lot of people understand Aloha as just this simple greeting, but it means it means so much more than that, right? It means hello and goodbye, but it also means love and compassion and empathy and friendship and just this, this kind of love where it's like we care for each other as kin because we know that if we if what we do to the web, it'll come back to us. If we poison the water, everyone else is going to be poisoned. So it's like caring for one another this way creates this element of um, sacredness that when we can see the sacredness you know, within each other, then we can create a different kind of world. And last night I was, um, I was with a group of individuals and you know, I'm talking about, about a connection to land And I asked them, you all went to the water fountain. You went and you got fresh water. And they're like, yes. I said, okay, so let's just imagine maybe a couple miles up, there is a, um, there's poisoning going on. There's a military base that is just dumping oil into your water. Will you drink that water? And they all kind of looked at me and I'm like, let me tell you a story. I said, my sister who lives in Hawaii, and this is something that she probably didn't even think about. She, she came to my other sister's house who lives here in Washington and we're together. And she says to my sister, do you all have water? And I'm like, well, why don't you just go ahead and drink water from the tap? And she was like, oh no, just bottled water. Do you have bottled water? And I looked at her and I'm like, the tap water is okay. And I didn't, I didn't go any further and question her. Why did she choose the bottled water over water from the tap? And in my mind, I'm thinking because of what's happening in Hawaii, she doesn't trust her resources. She doesn't trust her resources, but she hasn't even made that connection. She hasn't made that connection. So in this work that you do, when you find yourself in this place, and, and probably just help us with a little advice, when you find yourself in this place where you can be very angry and you see that there's injustices that is still continuing, how do you overcome that? How do you overcome that anger so that way you can invite people into the conversation? And I'm asking that because I'm struggling with it. <laughs> Yeah, I think the first thing, uh, honestly, is to allow yourself to be angry. And I think that when we try to suppress our anger, it finds it finds pathways out of us to come out sideways, right? And this is how lateral violence um, gets passed on. Um, but we need to allow ourselves to be angry. We la- need to allow ourselves to feel the injustice of what's happening. Um, and to give ourselves the spaciousness to be able to have real feelings about what's going on and allow those things to naturally rise up, move through the process and, and then come back, that energy to come back to a place of equilibrium. That doesn't mean that we're not angry anymore, but it means we're not going to react out of anger. We're going to respond out of necessity um, of the situation. And so, you know, whatever that situation that's that's making us so angry is uh, there is a need in there 
um, some type of necessity that that has to be addressed. Uh, you know, in the case of your sister, drinking water. Um, you know, for those who are uh, indigenous peoples who are living on the edge of industrial zones, which is happens quite frequently. We have all of these environmental illnesses. Um, and people that we love are being harmed by those things. Uh, and the reservation that I grew up on is an island nation in the, in the center of a river. And we had paper mills flanking us on all sides um, who were you know, parasitically relying upon this river that's the lifeblood of our ecosystem. Um, and so you know, there's a lot there to be angry about because people are, are suffering as a result of this injustice. Uh, and, you know, those are only environmental injustices. There's also social injustices. There's all of this systemic injustice that's related to um, politics, education, historical representations, even religious dogma. Um, there's mm -hmm. injustice that's built into that. You know, we call that uh, in the work that I'm doing um, with decolonization. When I talk about that and teach about that is the Bible, the bullet and the blackboard. Uh, right. And so there's there's all of this, um, all of these ways that our our thinking around some of these things has been contaminated by distortions of reality that are based on this illusion of separation. Um, and so we have to be able to let ourselves feel the the authenticity of the injustice that we're facing. Uh, in order to get to our own truth, because when we deny ourselves the opportunity to be angry, we deny ourselves opportunity to access our own truth. Um, I was doing this one healing ceremony with a group of activists of color who are on the front lines in various communities. We brought them to this retreat center for five days to uh, work with them on some of the trauma that they're carrying and to just give them space to, to deal with it, to feel it, to provide some tools to understanding um, some of the things that they were up against to give them language to define it um, more clearly. And there is one beautiful young black woman who was there um, and she was very, very stoic, very strong. And she started crying halfway through this five day period, probably the third day. Um, and it just gentle tears uh, in the morning, very quiet about them. Um, and she sat in the back of the room. Um, and then that evening, and it went on all day that she was you know, crying all day. Um, that evening, we had an activity where we were going to do an ancestral meditation to see if we could connect with our ancestors to see what guidance they might have for us. Um, and she started crying very hard in the middle of that um, meditation. And uh, she tried to leave the room. And I said, oh, please don't leave. You know, just stay here with this. If you want to sit in the back, sit in the back, but don't don't go. Just stay here with this uh, process and just just allow it to take you to where it needs to go. And so there were 50 people that we brought in for that from all across the country. And um, we had to go through all of the other people before she was even capable of speaking. And she said that she had always been ashamed to cry. And um, she wasn't ever going to let anybody have the satisfaction of knowing that they got to her enough to make her cry. And um, what came to her during that ancestral um, meditation was that uh, her ancestor said to her, you know, don't you ever hide your tears. You're crying for all of us who couldn't cry for ourselves when our babies were taken, when our bodies were broken, uh, when we were stolen from our homelands. And so we have all of this stuff that we have to feel not only for ourselves, but for those who came before us who didn't have the liberty of even expressing the emotions that they carried about these things. So I think that the, the best advice that I can give is to just allow yourself to have an authentic experience of feeling the injustice of what you're up against in these systems of colonization, capitalism, and this distortion of patriarchy that's so imbalanced. Um, because if we start to normalize the suppression of our own feelings in relation to this distortion, it moves us further away from the truth. Um, so, you know, once we go through that process, then we can show up with a proper response. Um, that's not a reaction to the anger, but is a response to the injustice that underlies it. And that's where we need to be to be effective. Yes, <clears throat> you call it um, sacred activism. And I, you know, it's like, um, I just pulled up 
I, I, I quote you a lot in my dissertation. <laughs> So there's this one part where I say, um, as I engage in the work of Sherry Mitchell, she brings forth what she describes as sacred activism by inviting both native and non-native people to discuss ways of healing the trauma of colonization shared by all. Can you say more about that? It's like, how do we, how do we share or, you know, discuss ways of healing trauma of colonization shared by all? Well, I mean, that's a big, that's a big question. <laughs> Yeah. With, with no easy answer. Um, right. You know, I think that uh, one of the other things that I talk about is conquest activism in opposition to this. Um, and so, you know, really thinking about the, the underlying energy that is connected to the type of activism that you're doing. Are you aligned with the energies of destruction and death? Or are you aligned with the energies of creation and life? Um, I had this incredible opportunity to get very, very sick uh, several years ago, and I had been doing a lot of deconstructive and destructive forms of activism, like taking, taking down the system, investing all of my time in trying to dismantle the system that is so well constructed that there's no dismantling it possible. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing about the thing about movements and about activism is that it's largely built on mythology um, that's not based in reality. And so what the system, and I'm writing about this in the follow-up to Sacred Instructions, which is a book called Rise Wild. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, there's this illusion that infiltration into the system um, is success within a movement. Uh, and all that is is the expansion and inclusion into the status quo. It doesn't actually change anything. It just gives representation to another group who's been excluded from it. And so greater inclusion means expansion of, strengthening of, and deeper entanglement with the current system. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when we think about all of the energy that we put into creating those tiny openings where there's a slight bit more inclusion for somebody who's been excluded, we're not changing anything. We're just strengthening and, um, and moving ourselves into a system that's happy to consume us and add us to, uh, to this uh, machinery. And so, you know, really thinking about, I read this really great quote um, and I'm, I'm partnered now because uh, one of the things about really being committed to making the world a better place is that um, most people don't have have the conviction to stay with that kind of thing for very long. And, and I remember when um, my ex-husband said to me about, I don't know, 14 years ago, he said, you know, it just occurred to me that you really want to change the world and I just want to live in it. And I said, well, someone has to make sure there's a place for you to live, right? Um, and so uh, I'm now partnered with someone who's also uh, committed to making the world a better place. Um, and one of the beautiful things that, that he said in, in talking about the evolution of our relationship over the last decade um, or the last nine years is, is that, um, you know, we weren't able to really see each other when we were involved in this conquest form of activism, when we were in our big warrior selves with all of them. Um, and he said, it wasn't until I stopped giving all of my energy and attention to the systems that infuriated me and started actively being in relationship with the earth that I love, that I was able to open myself up enough to see you clearly. And so I think that's it, right? Like when we're investing all of our energy into going up against these systems that infuriate us, that are creating all of this injustice, um, we're essentially just, you know, throwing pebbles at a brick wall um, and hoping that one day enough pebbles will amass to collapse it. Uh, in the meantime, they have all of the heavy machinery that comes in and cleans all those pebbles up periodically, opens up space, allows more people to enter. So there's less people throwing stones on the other side. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't really get anywhere any different. 
And so what we really need to be thinking about is um, there was this, somebody, I spoke at this conference um, in the spring for um, leaders within the education um, community. And uh, somebody sent me a book, a little tiny book that has all of these like, it's just a book of memes, essentially, <laughs> beautiful quotes. And there was a quote in there by Angela Davis about, um, you know, this work of healing ourselves, uh, that that never used to be a part of the social justice movement, but now it's central. And we're realizing that that may be the most revolutionary act that we can take is to heal ourselves from the impacts and the effects and the indoctrination of the mind. Um, what I, you know, I, I have this term that I got years ago from a friend of mine, DJ Vanis, that says, you know, this reservation of the mind, um, where we lock ourselves into this ideology that doesn't serve us, right? We're collectively investing our time and our energy in co-creating a world that none of us would individually want to want to live in. Um, and we're not actively creating the world that we want to inhabit. So what Angela Davis says most recently in this little book of memes that I have, um, and I think the name of the book is Lead with Love. And it's kind of a little teal colored book. It's really, it's really great. Um, and, and she talks about becoming a citizen of the world that you want to inhabit. What does it feel like to be a citizen of the world that you want to inhabit? Who do you have to be? How do you behave? How do you relate to others within that world? Uh, what does it look like to be in healthy relationship with people? You know, and when we start thinking about things from that, from the end and come back, um, then we can start to see how it's not really about changing systems, it's about changing the citizenry um, and the world that the citizenry uh, inhabits. Um, changes with it because we have the power of that influence with our energy and our powers of co-creation that are being engaged all the time, whether we're conscious of them or not. Um, we're actively co-creating the world that we're living in by all of the attention we're giving to the things that we don't like. We're amplifying them, right? And yes. so, yeah. And so, you know, that whole spiritual activism piece recognizes that we can't heal without the healing of the earth. The earth can't heal without our healing, that we're interconnected, symbiotic, and, and interrelated, and, and completely uh, and unable to be separated from one another in that process of healing. And so, you know, it can't be this and then that. It has to be happening simultaneously, yes. just seeing ourselves in relation to all other living beings you know, having this simultaneous individualized experience of ourselves, it's the same with our healing. It has to be this integral process where we're all simultaneously having this experience of healing, changing the energetic vibration and elevating the evolution of the consciousness of the planet. And that's- You are, you are speaking my language. Yeah. So the, um, my, um, I, have a, I have a little, it's just my husband and I, this consulting firm. And it's co three consulting, which is co creating cohesive communities. Mm. We can't, we you know, we realize that we can't, we can't do this without each other. Mm. And you know, my husband, who is, you know, I mean, he's a man of European descent. There was a there was a moment in our relationship. We've been married for um, eighteen years, and um, probably about six, seven years ago, when I first entered into, you know, my program on this journey of, of, um, you know, discovering and rediscovering my, my indigeneity, I went through this process where I, I needed to undo some things. So I went to, I went to um, this, uh, this course, it was called Undoing Institutional Racism. And they were talking a lot about, um, you know, the inequities and people of color. And this is what, you know, people of European descent has done. And this is how they, they benefit from the system and all of these things. And um, I came back home and this was probably like a, a three-day three um, program. I came back home and I looked at my husband and I was like, you are everything I want to dismantle. And 
we went through this process of an entire year where um, we slept in separate rooms. We, um, you know, every time he would come and walk into the room, I'd be like, here you are again, colonizing my space. So I kept calling him the colonizer. And um, it was going back and forth for an entire year. And I kept doing my research and everything. And, and while I was doing that, he started to question, well, why is she calling me the colonizer? Why is she, you know, why is she saying these things? And so he did a little, he was doing his research and he's like, hey, so you're the, you're the biggest colonizers on the planet. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, you're not only Hawaiian. He goes, you're Filipino, Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese. And I'm like, and? And he goes, so you have colonizer within you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And as I, as I say that, I'm, I'm discovering myself and I'm like, oh my gosh, the Philippines was colonized by the Spaniards for over 400 years. They ran around with the Portuguese and then within me, I have it all. And I had to sit with that. I had to sit with that for a long time. And I'm like, wow, so I'm the colonizer and I'm the, and the colonized. And during that time, in, that, in this whole entire year, there was also a moment where my grandson, who was only five at the time, he's 13 now, he, um, he comes to me and he's like, hey, Jima, is Moana your people? And I'm like, yes, Moana is my people. And he's like, so is Moana my people? And I'm like, yes, Moana's your people. So my husband is on in the living room. He's flipping through the HBO channels and he comes across Vikings. And he's like, this is my people. And so Lyric is like, wait a minute, Papa, is Vikings your people? And he's like, yes. And so his grandmother um, is Norwegian as well, too. So he goes back home and he was like, you know, Jima, my papa is Norwegian and you're Norwegian. So Vikings is your people. So Lyric comes back and he goes, Jima, you said that Moana is my people. And I'm like, yes. And he goes, and so my other Jima, Vikings is her people. So that makes Vikings my people. And I, I felt this tinge of jealousy in that moment because I wanted to claim him for just myself. Yeah. And he says, Jima, do you not like my other Jima? And I'm like, of course I like your other Jima. He goes, do you not love Papa? I'm like, I do love Papa. And I'm like, why are you asking this? He goes, because when I hear you talking about people who look like my Papa and my Jima, you call them colonizer and you say things that's not nice. He goes, so Jima, what part of me do you not love? Ooh. Five years old. Yeah. Oh, Sherry, my heart just broke into a million pieces and I didn't know how to work with that. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's got to be all of us. We are all affected by colonization. And there's some of us like myself that is both colonizer and colonized. I can't dissect myself. I can't ask my grandson to separate himself. So in order to find healing, we've got to do it collectively. Yes. We've got to do it collectively. And, you know, the, the thing about it is being able to listen to other people, share their stories and share the things that they've, they've um, you know, that they've dealt with. And, you know, in, um, <laughs> again, in my dissertation where I, where I'm just have everything in there about you, um, I have this, I have this section where it says um, the critical component of transforming conflict is the willingness to sit with those who disagree with our position and thus, and thus, and that must, they must be willing to listen closely to what they are saying to hear their needs and then work toward finding the apex of where the needs of all parties converge. And so this, this ideology, as I was reading your book, I'm like, oh my gosh, this falls in line with the framework that I drew from in aloha. You know, it's like aloha, yes, it means all of the words. It's a greeting. It means hello, goodbye, you know, love and compassion. But when we, when we separate the word alo, alo is forward facing and front. 
and ha is the breath of life. So when we are engaging in these conversations that can be uncomfortable, we are sharing the breath of life with one another. And so I'm like, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion without talking about colonization. Can't talk about colonization without talking about how do we actually co-create these spaces where we can collectively heal, collectively heal. And so I changed my mindset. You know, it's like um, reading your words helped me change my mindset to where I needed to be aware of the energy that my words carry. Because I knew that my words actually can actually break a person down or build somebody up. Which means that if I'm going to be following in your footsteps and writing a book myself, there is responsibility and accountability to the words, to the words that I'm sharing because it carries a lot of energy. You know, I think that that's, that's so powerful. Um, I was thinking about your, you're talking about your husband and um, my partner, uh, actually has relatives who came off the Mayflower. And I'm a Northeastern Woodlands native, you know, Skijinuiapid uh, from this uh, indigenous woman from this territory of first contact. And, um, and so we're doing this, you know, interdimensional cross-cultural healing just with our relationship. And, and we've had conversations like the ones that you mentioned. And then um, you know, out of the mouths of babes, uh, in my daughter and son-in-law, um, at a very, very young age, they're still very young, um, still in their twenties, uh, adopted two little girls from a family member who was having some very, or is having some very severe struggles, um, with addiction and they're on my son-in-law's side. Um, so they're not biologically connected to me. Um, but they are the children of my heart. I couldn't possibly be any closer to them and love them anymore. And so when we talk about these issues of blood and all of this, this differencing that we're um, talking about and the ways that we connect and identify with one another, um, I think it's important for us to have those kinds of connections that you have with your husband, that I have with these beautiful granddaughters, because it helps us to soften um, the space within us for engaging in the work necessary to be able to say, how do we do this work? We're doing it in relation to those that we love the most. Uh, this is never how I envisioned becoming a grandmother. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wanted to be there to catch my grandbabies and to sing them a welcome song in our language. Um, you know, and not have them come in this way through trauma and crisis and, um, you know, a, a sense of desperate need to be loved and cared for, um, which, you know, we're grateful that we have that opportunity to love them in that way and that they've been sent to love us in that way. Um, it's a real gift. But when we start thinking about the work that we need to do for that healing, it starts right there, doesn't it? It starts right in that place where... Um, you know, my partner and I have had conversations about the power dynamic between him being a, a white male whose voice is often centered, who has, you know, this amount of education from these schools at, of reputation and whose family is situated in these communities of affluence that, uh, and I grew up sleeping six to a bed, right? Um, in a house where the walls weren't even painted, they were raw sheetrock. And so the, you know, the difference in the power dynamic and the ways that that power is wielded has to be addressed within our personal relationships. Um, and then, you know, creating this um, understanding, core level understanding that's based in a depth of love changes people in ways that no amount of lecture ever will. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we're changing that ourselves, we're also learning how to help guide other people towards that. And I think that that's really the key where um, when we think about that kind of transformative change in relation to in, in relation to ourselves, 
uh, how we apply that and leverage that in organizations and then in relation to systems is different. But we can't even begin the process of doing that work unless we've addressed our own anger, unless we've addressed uh, our own suspicion, right? Mm -hmm. Very suspicious. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it's yeah. like we, we always talk about changing the system, you know, and, uh, you know, people are like, oh, you know, we want to go ahead and we want to change the system. I'm like, there's no changing the system. The system was set up and it's doing exactly what it was built to do. We can't change systems unless we change the hearts and minds of the individuals that's within the system. So it begins with, it begins with all of us and having, having that love and that compassion and that empathy and and also being able to observe what is happening in our bodies being aware of that energy that we're actually you know that's within us and what we're expelling to other people sharing with other people because we can feel it all the time and I feel that when we're aware of those emotions and we can just get back to our breath just take a breath just go out in nature, take a walk, whatever it is, plant your feet in the ground, then you can relax a little. You can be more resilient in engaging in these conversations and these initiatives that can be so draining of our energy. You know, so, one, of the, one of the challenges I think that people in urban centers have is that, um, you know, there have been studies done about transmission of energy from the earth. And it'll pass through untreated concrete, but it doesn't pass through asphalt. And so they can't trace that energy up through the bottom of asphalt. Um, and in order for us to have our um, electrical systems grounded, we have to have some point of time where our feet are actually touching the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that's really critical for people to recognize. And I mean, and that's one of the reasons why we need to start deconstructing some of these old parking lots and abandoned malls in the middle of uh, urban centers and planting gardens and parks, creating, you know, forests, food forests, uh, all of these types of things, because we actually have to have that contact with the earth in order for our electrical circuitry in our body to work properly. We have to have the right amount of water. We have to have all of these things that are connected to our survival, you know, and the sources of our survival, not resources, right? The earth is not a resource. The water is not, mm. a resource, the air is not a resource, but all of those things have been commodified by the current system and, and are turned into consumptive goods, right? Um, and that's happened to us as well. And so how do we get ourselves out of that loop of consumption and uh, you know uh, capitalism and consumption, it's just you know you're either a consumer or you're a commodity uh, yes. in the system. And the only way for us to break that loop is for us to separate ourselves from the mechanisms that keep us moving in this. It really is a cannibalistic system, um, and, and move ourselves outside of it. So you know, the importance of having physical contact with the earth is really deeply connected to our ability to be able to heal ourselves and our societies and, um, you know, the entire systems that we're connected to. That matrix of connection that we have with the earth is really central to the healing of the whole thing for all of us. Wow, and if we don't have access to that, we're not gonna heal. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I mean, I even think about, you know, being far away from, from my own lands and, you know, what I feel when I first step foot off that plane, I go to the beach, I jump into the water and I can feel my whole entire body feels at home. And it stays with me for a long time after I come back to the mainland, but I need that. I need to be near the water. And I can feel it. And I'm sure that there's other individuals that can feel it as well, too. It's like, what is this disconnection? Well, we hardly ever talk about that. And we don't teach about that. We don't teach about that kind of that spiritual connection, that connection that we can feel down to our bones. 
So yeah, that, that, that really makes me think about, you know, um, being far from that, uh, that medicine. We're going to find ourselves sick if we don't connect back to that medicine. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, this this uh, makes me think about also um, what you illustrated for me is that we are all connected to mana or this divine energy that is the source of our being and that we can never be separated from that source because I feel that sometimes that source informs us of our true power of our true power. And so, yeah, your, everything that I read in sacred instruction, it really helped to exemplify um, the prescription of aloha that I've been, you know, that I've been working on and for transforming um, our society into one that advances healing, hope, love, and peace for all. And so what are the things are you doing? How can, how can people find you? What workshops do you have coming up and all of those other things? Well, there are two websites. Um, I have the landpeacefoundation.org um, and you can see all of the things that we're doing there. It's a lot of things that we're doing um, there. And then I also have an author's website, which is sacredinstructions.life which is in the process of being overhauled. Um, I gave somebody artistic freedom with it and their artistic choices are very different. Than my own. So uh, I'm, I'm making peace with myself about that and, and, and uh, working on that. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff on there for workshops. Um, and I will have something coming up um, sometime in the near future about the stories that we tell that I'm actually gonna do with my partner. Um, and we're gonna look at the narratives that have carried each of us forward, him as someone whose ancestors come off the Mayflower and me whose ancestors are here. Um, and uh, also what are the stories that we need to reach back for beyond the time of colonization? And, and how do we carry those forward and bring them into active presence in this time in order to be able to frame the stories that we need to carry us into the future? Uh, so we're gonna be doing that workshop and that will be announced on the website. I also have, um, I, I'm terrible about social media, but I also have um, a public Facebook page and Instagram um, sacred instructions. You can find me under facebook.com slash sacred instructions. And, um, on Twitter, it's at sacred 411. And, um, and then my Instagram is under sacred instructions as well. So there's, there's all of those means of, of figuring out what I'm doing. And, um, I usually will post upcoming events, um, or someone will post upcoming events. Sometimes it's me. Um, and, uh, then I'm going to try to take some time off the end of the year and just really be present with all that is, um, and enjoy some of what you've been talking about. I live here on this beautiful land here that I've reclaimed in my home territory. I reclaimed a 210 acre farm that was given away in a land grant the year that Maine became a state from our territory. Um, and now we have, uh, with Juke from Deltina here. And um, I talk about this experience uh, in, in some of the talks that I've done recently about having um, this, this time of healing connected with the earth where when I, was, when I was very sick, one of the things that made me feel better was laying a thin orange blanket out on the grass and laying face down like on the earth so that my heart was connected to the heart of the earth. Um, and, you know, as an activist, as, and as an indigenous person who was really, who grew up in a riverine culture, who was very determined to protect the waterways that were part of the lifeblood of my people um, and having been grown with that fire for that. Um, you know, I did a lot of activism on behalf of the earth and had 
had a lot of experiences of deep connection with my own homelands, um, but realized that the earth herself, the essence of the earth herself, um, that I hadn't spent enough time in deep relationship with that spirit. Um, and so in this process of healing, like laying with my heart connected to the heart of the earth and just, um, you know, really reaching out in some ways or sinking in, you know, just almost envisioning myself sinking into the earth um, for this process of healing. Um, I felt the earth also reaching back toward me. And so there's not just this like reaching out and acting on behalf of, I felt this real gentle, loving presence of the earth reaching back toward me in this way that was so sweet and tender. And it gave me this essence of, of the spirit that the earth carries and how this is, this is the energy with which she's been able to maintain and sustain our lives for millennia, despite the horrific ways that we have behaved in the last few centuries. Um, and to continue to love us and to continue to try to provide us with what we need to survive. This real gentle, loving, maternal energy at the core of the earth, um, this presence of life that exists there that, that we're connected to. I think that, you know, in everything that we're doing right now, we need to be not only uh, reaching towards the earth, but just holding the space for the earth to reach back towards us and and educate us. And the first time I walked here on this land, I had some of my board members with me and uh, we were walking and um, the people that were with me are also from the tribal communities here in this territory. And uh, one of them said something to me in the language and I responded to them in the language. And when we did that, we felt the land like do that. Oh, I recognize that language. Um, and so, you know, I talk about this place as we've looked at all of these places that captured our imagination. Some of them touched our hearts, but this is the first place that reached up and literally grabbed our feet um, as we were walking here. And I think that people don't take enough time to just allow the space for the feeling of the earth reaching back towards us with the same kind of love and, uh, and care that we have for her. And so that's, that's what I'm, I'm gonna wanna be focusing on, I think in, in finishing the second book, uh, this follow-up book to Sacred Instructions in that series. Um, and also there's uh, seven anthologies that I've contributed to during COVID, <laughs> so, uh, which is why I haven't finished the follow-up to Sacred Instructions because I've been busy. Um, and one of those that I think is really important for people is a book called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Um, and it's an, it's an anthology of 60 different women writers from a broad spectrum, from frontline activists, NASA scientists, you know, poets, um, indigenous peoples who are on the front lines of the protection of their lands. Uh, so it's like this really broad spectrum of female voices, of the women coming forward with um, their plea for all that we can say, right? Um, and so uh, that's something that I also um, think people should should be looking into. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of things brewing and, and you know, all of it really comes down to story, right? Yes, yes, it does. It does come down to story and being able to engage in these sacred conversations. And, you know, it's like, um, you know, your work, I feel that it just blends so nicely with the evolution of Aloha. And, you know, it's like looking at Aloha, the A is to ask questions and inquire. And if you're going to ask questions and inquire, then you're going to listen, listen with your whole self, with your whole body, with everything that you have. And if you're going to ask and listen, observe what comes up in your body, right? The somatic responses that happens and always staying, the H is the heart focus, is always staying heart focused, being centered around around the heart and not the heart of, of the earth, like you're talking about and, and the people. And the final A is adapt and acknowledge that we all come from different places with different ideas. But I feel that there is a common goal for all of us to not only survive, but to thrive and to be loved and honored and, and cared for. And 
I am, I, I, I am so honored and I feel so blessed to have spent this, this time with you. Just, uh, you have been, you have been my mentor and, um, I've been girl fanning you the whole entire time. <laughs> I follow you on Instagram, on Facebook, <laughs> and I try to make it out because I know that you, um, you had a workshop at the uh, Omega Institute. And I was like, oh my goodness, I wanted to come out and just be there and, and share space with you. This is, this is great that we're, we're sharing this time together on, you know, on, on Zoom, but I'd really like to share some sacred space with you soon. Yeah, yeah, I think that we need to do that. And um, the next time in Seattle, I'll let you know. Absolutely, or if I go up to Maine, I haven't been to the East Coast. I've been to New York and Florida, that's it. <laughs> that's not the East Coast. That's what I heard. <laughs> That's what I heard. Well, thank you, yeah. Sherry, so much for, for spending this time with me and being here. And I am just so honored to be in your presence. And I, I look forward to seeing how we can um, be together in, in a lot of different ways, as well as Indigenous sisters and creators. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry Mitchell, for joining us on the Evolution of Aloha podcast. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. You have been listening to the Evolution of Aloha podcast, a Plowline production. Tune in for upcoming episodes with other amazing people. And don't forget to subscribe to the Evolution of Aloha and Plowline podcast that's available on all of your popular podcast platforms. This is Jerry Balarosa Tanel. Thank you so much for being here. For non-edited content, um, there will be an exclusive offer on Patreon. And so please go to patreon.com backslash Plowline Productions. And please help us continue this work by becoming a supporter and head over. And um, yeah, your contributions will go directly toward producing and building engaging and quality content. So again, this is the evolution of Aloha podcast. This is Dr. Jerry Ibala Rosa Tanel. Ahui ho. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and each other. Aloha everyone and mahalo. <laughs>